Uh, this is clearly a form of scleroderma that does, uh, that's much different from systemic disease, and it does not have internal organ involvement. So for someone like this, or for someone with the photo we saw just previously, the linear scleroderma, you don't have to do pulmonary function tests or echocardiograms or any of those other, other tests because it doesn't affect the internal organs. And then this is probably the most common form of morphia, which are spots. Uh, this is, whoops, let's go back up. Uh, you can see this is on the thigh of an individual. Uh, there is this white scarred area surrounding a uh, red rim that's inflammatory. There's a, whoops, a lesion there, uh, and several other lesions. So morphia can occur as one spot or as multiple spots. This is a patient of mine. You have to kind of look closely. There is this whitish area. Uh, on the side of the foot, that's a scar, does not have a red rim, is not active, is not extending, and this is the only spot this individual had. She was very worried when her doctor told her she had scleroderma because, like you, most likely, she went online, looked at systemic scleroderma, and got all worried and anxious <coughs> because she was concerned there was internal organ involvement, and fortunately for her, there was not. So. Let's look at systemic scleroderma, which is probably what most of the people who are patients in this room have. Well, there are uh, three different kinds. There's limited, diffuse, and cine, or without skin involvement. And you can imagine limited scleroderma sounds a lot like localized scleroderma. And this is the form that is most confusing to patients and most confusing to physicians. About 60% of all cases of systemic scleroderma is limited, about 40% is diffuse, and then there's one to 5% of cine, which is to say they have the disease, but they have no skin involvement, which makes it very difficult from a diagnostic point of view to diagnose. So uh, diffuse and limited, the uh, distinction is the degree of skin involvement. Some people think that it means it's systemic if you have lung involvement or heart or other internal organ. No, limited versus diffuse is distinguished solely on the basis of the extent of skin involvement. If you're limited, then you have skin involvement from the elbows down, usually just affecting the hands, maybe also affecting the feet, perhaps also affecting the face. And after two years of disease, if your skin involvement remains that involving those areas, it's not going to be diffuse. Diffuse tends to happen in the first few years, certainly within two, certainly within five years of disease. So uh, the limited involvement both can, form, uh, can involve the face, but the distal areas of the arms and legs. And the, there's a reason for making that distinction, and the reason is more important to those of us who study epidemiology, because people with limited disease, if you take 100 patients with limited scleroderma, they are less likely to develop severe or progressive internal organ involvement, whereas the diffuse form is sort of the flip side of that. But that's only if you look at large numbers of patients. Each individual patient can be the exception to that rule. So I think it's important perhaps from your physician's point of view, but less important from your point of view in terms of what your risks are for developing uh, internal organ. And this is a photo of someone with longstanding diffuse disease, and you can see the pigment changes of her hands and the flexion contractures of the fingers. This is probably 20 years old, if not more, from the uh, rheumatology slide collection. And uh, this is the kind of scleroderma, these are complications of scleroderma that we certainly hope to avoid by newer treatments. So one question I get a lot, how many people have scleroderma? And uh, is that frequency or incidence increasing? And so I'm sure many of you or who have scleroderma or have family members with scleroderma never heard the term before. You were diagnosed. Once you were diagnosed, you started meeting other people with the same diagnosis. So the sense 
is that it must be increasing in incidence. Well, uh, morphia, localized, about 200,000 people in the U.S. Systemic scleroderma, maybe 100,000. Uh, the estimates vary by country, and from my interest in scleroderma, I'm very interested in why there is a dis difference between uh, the, the frequency of scleroderma in Europe and that in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, there have not been good studies in China, or uh, there have been good studies in Japan, and it seems to be less frequent in Japan. I've gone to China on multiple occasions because we have a research collaboration with them. And there's lots of scleroderma patients in China, but there are so many people in China that it's right now impossible to determine the frequency. But I've seen people in Asia and in Europe and in the UK with scleroderma, and I can tell you it looks the same as the scleroderma patients I see in the US. So the disease isn't different, maybe the frequency is, um, so, uh, CREST. How many people here were first diagnosed as CREST? Yeah, many people. Then it's an, uh, an acronym that we do not use very much anymore because it's unusual for somebody to have all five features. This got into the medical literature several years ago. I first heard it when I was a medical student, which was a long time ago. But uh, calcinosis can happen in diffuse scleroderma. Almost everybody has Raynaud's phenomenon, 95% or more of scleroderma patients. Again, almost everybody has some esophageal involvement. Sclerodactyly means um, skin thickness of the fingers, which again is sort of everybody. And the telangiectasias, those red spots on the face or red spots on the hands that everybody hates, but there's not much you can do about them. That happens frequently as well. The point of having subsections or sub-diagnoses of all of scleroderma is to say, well, if you have this form, then we can predict what's likely to happen. And the crust syndrome does not distinguish people with more or less risks of developing internal organ disease. So from a diagnostic point of view, it's not, from a prognostic point of view, predictive, it's not very helpful. From a diagnostic point of view, I think the best service that it fills is that physicians who don't see a lot of scleroderma will remember the term crest and will look at a patient and say, ah, Raynaud's, reflux, thick of the, uh, thickening of the skin of the fingers, it looks like scleroderma to me. So from that point of view, I guess it's, it's uh, a helpful distinction. So calcinosis. This is uh, something I'm going to talk about very briefly and then go on to something else, because this is something none of us know what to do about. It is annoying. It tends to occur in pressure points. So the thumbs, uh, sometimes the feet, over the forearms, where you rest your arm. And once it starts, it can go away on its own. It can stay stable. It can worsen. And although people have tried lots and lots of different medications, nothing seems to help. So right now it's an area of active research, but unfortunately we don't have a, a therapy that seems to be effective. And if you do an x-ray, uh, and you can, ah, so you see this individual who happens to be a patient of mine, there's these three areas and the, the white base, it's not pus, it's little pieces of calcium, uh, look like it's coming from three different areas. But if you do an x-ray of that, this is what you see. It's actually lots of calcium underneath the skin in addition to those three areas that are breaking through. And this is why it is difficult to surgically remove them because what you're seeing on the surface of the skin is just the tip of the iceberg. And if, you try to, if a surgeon tries to scoop all of that out, they're going to remove the thumb pad. And it's going to be very difficult for that to heal. And if you remove one small area, then it could just recur even in the same area. The exception to that is if these things get infected, because once infected, it can be hard to clear the infection as long as that calcium, which acts like a foreign body, is there. And that's the few times that I would refer somebody to our hand surgeon to say, 
what can you do about this? Because the antibiotics can be helpful, but when they don't work, surgery is sort of a, a second or third option. Okay, so this is the pallor phase. Ah, and that's all. And then, oh, well, actually, if you look closely, you can also see that the tip of this finger is bluish, purplish. So, and, and it's not that all fingers simultaneously go white, all fingers then turn blue, but the beginning of an episode, if you wanted to take part in this study that is now being planned and probably won't be operational till early in 2019, but nonetheless, think about that. So uh, moving on, calcinosis, raynaud, esophageal dysfunction, uh, reflux common in the general population. I mean, who here, even without scleroderma, has not had episodes of heartburn? Uh, frequently associated with pregnancy, spicy foods, tomato paste, pizza. So everybody knows pretty much what heartburn is. But why is it that in scleroderma, it happens a lot? It happens every day, several times a day. And uh, it's much different in frequency and severity than you would expect out of from general run-of-the-mill uh, heartburn. And the reason is that the muscles of the esophagus, instead of contracting in a synchronized fashion, so you swallow and the upper part of the esophagus opens and then that closes, there's a wave and the uh, muscles then contract at the top open in the middle, contract in the middle, open at the bottom, and then go into the stomach. And if you'll remember as a kid, when you used to stand on your head, you didn't get reflux. <laughs> the reason that happens is because there is a sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus that keeps food from going, or uh, from the, or that keeps acid actually, from going from the stomach into the esophagus because that contractility, that motility, is supposed to be one way. It goes into the stomach, it's not supposed to come back out of the stomach. But in scleroderma, the sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus becomes weak, so that when the stomach contracts, which it does off and on all the time, some of the stomach acid washes back into the lower esophagus. And what all of the medicines that we use currently do, the Prilosec, Omeprazole, Nexium, all of those, they decrease the stomach acid. So you can still have contents from the stomach, some fluid coming from the stomach into the esophagus, but it doesn't burn because it's not acidic anymore. So this is a normal esophagus, which is not particularly wide. And this is where it is contracting so that nothing goes through here. And then it goes into, let's see, then ah, this is relaxed. Here's the sphincter going into the stomach. And this is in scleroderma, the esophagus, the muscles become lax and the esophagus widens. And uh, so there's easily, uh, easy access of stomach contents into the esophagus. If that burning, if, if that reflux of acid happens over and over and over again, you can get a stricture in the esophagus, a scar tissue formation that then gets dilated uh, in endoscopy. Ah, well, as for sclerodactyly, I think most people have this puffy fingers that then become, uh, the skin becomes thicker and tighter than usual. And the telangiectasia is the red spots. This is uh, from one of my patients as well, the back and the face. Uh, these essentially don't mean anything in terms of disease severity. Uh, they, when they're in the skin, they seldom, seldom bleed. If they're inside, sometimes in the stomach, they can bleed. Uh, annoying, you can get them lasered uh, by a cosmetic dermatologist. But as you can tell, if you've got multiple, multiple ones, it becomes difficult to do and they tend to recur. So let's go from skin and those sorts of complications to internal organ involvement. And what we are, uh, we as physicians treating scleroderma patients are at most worrisome uh, is the development of interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. 
Uh, so this is scar tissue, collagen buildup in the, uh, in the lungs. It starts at the bases of the lungs and sometimes stays there forever and sometimes sort of slowly marches up. Uh, it can occur in limited or diffuse disease. And how do we know it's there? By pulmonary function tests. And uh, the pulmonary function tests are abnormal. So you want to know how are you sure that the reason they're abnormal is because of scleroderma lung disease. That's when you do the CAT scan. So this is a normal chest x-ray, whoops, uh, which is not very sensitive. What you're looking for there are the lung fields and air is radio opaque. So the x-ray go through it. It doesn't form a shadow. Water and bone are radio dense. So uh, you can see the outline and this is the heart. Okay, so this is scleroderma interstitial lung disease on an x-ray. Not particularly impressive. You can see that there's kind of more white marks out here than there should be. It's not as clear at the bottom of the lungs as it is at the top. But if you were to do a CAT scan, well, here's a normal CAT scan. Again, the um, normal lung is this uh, deep gray color. And these are the blood vessels going out. They start out sort of large vessels in the middle of the lungs and then branch out into very fine blood vessels. And this is what scleroderma interstitial lung disease looks like on a CAT scan. There is a lot more white stuff because that white stuff is the scar tissue and it's taking place, it's replacing the air sacs. since so the air sacs that you need to exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. Without those air sacs, you don't breathe as well. So uh, we're going to now look at serum uh, markers of scleroderma. So do people know uh, what their ANA <coughs> status is, their anti-nuclear antibody? Yeah, so how many here with scleroderma uh, have a positive ANA? OK, um, um, it should be almost everybody, not 90%, not quite 100%. Uh, and the screening test is an ANA. So 90% of scleroderma patients will be positive. Um, and as opposed to 95% uh, of lupus patients, almost actually this should be closer to 99% of lupus patients. So if you have a positive ANA, your doctor can't distinguish on that basis alone if you have lupus or if you have scleroderma. So you have to go to other testing. And uh, of the people here, well, we'll go over the antibodies. So the scleroderma-specific autoantibodies. So there's SCL70. Do people here know if they're SCL, okay, SCL70 positive? Centromere? Not a few people, okay. Well, RNA poll three. All right, now this is a newer antibody. Uh, it is now sort of in, in general use. There was a time uh, when it was uh, considered a research uh, uh, test only, but now the commercial labs have figured it out and they can charge your insurance money for it, so it's easy to get. Now there's the, the others, the fibrillarin, U3 RNP, PMSCL, THTO, are much less common, but I think they're very helpful to get. THTO at the bottom is still a research um, test. There's one commercial lab that's doing it, and I don't know what that code is. I try to get it, but it's very difficult. One of the things though, that's kind of nice about scleroderma and, again, distinguishes it from lupus is that these autoantibodies are mutually exclusive. If you are centromere positive, you will not be SCL70 positive or RNA poll 3 positive. So once your doctor gets a positive test, you can sort of stop there because that's your autoantibody and you're not going to get others. OK, so how is scleroderma diagnosed? Uh, I was part of the uh, committee that established the classification criteria. It used to be very simple, but you know how things are. When you have a committee that's going to decide them, uh, it becomes much more complex. One of the problems with the old criteria is that it missed 
10 to 15 percent of scleroderma patients. These are people that doctors see and they think they have rhinos, they have thick skin of the fingers, they've got to be scleroderma, but they don't fit the criteria and it's hard to make that diagnosis. So the purpose of establishing new criteria is that we can capture people with a correct diagnosis earlier in the course of their disease. So here's the criteria, uh, which you probably can't read very well, but it's a scoring system. Lupus has now gone to a scoring system and some of the, our other autoimmune diseases. So you get certain points for having certain features. So if you have skin thickening of the fingers only or puffy hands, that gets you a couple of points. Uh, if you have uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, that gets you three more points. If you've got one of the autoantibodies, that gives you three, so now three, six, eight, we're up to eight. But you need one more thing in order to have a total of nine, which puts you in a definite scleroderma category. And the thing that I think uh, people frequently get if they don't have a lot of skin involvement is this telangiectasias. That gives you a couple more points so people can more readily fit nicely into a diagnosis. So uh, we're going to talk a little about the um, randomized trials. These are the ones that were conducted uh, up through 2007. There was the first multicenter randomized trial of depenicillamine. There was a photophoresis methotrexate, uh, one in the UK. I didn't participate in that one. Uh, there was this medicine called relaxin. There was oral collagen tolerance, uh, the TGF-beta, BUILD-2, the first lung study, and the SCOT trial, which is the high-dose chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue. Uh, so what were the results? Well, the first one we did, the multicenter trial, we were all very optimistic. The uh, results were negative. There was no difference between the usual dose and essentially a placebo dose, um, the photophoresis. The methotrexate trial was, mild, is, was positive from the point of view it was mildly helpful for uh, skin fibrosis, and it was fairly helpful for joint and tendon inflammation. So I still use it, and other people definitely do. But the other trials on and on and on were all negative until we got to the lung study, the scleroderma lung study one. It was the first positive trial. And then, of course, the uh, stem cell transplant trial. We're going to talk about both of these uh, a little more. So um, the scleroderma lung studies. SLS1 looked at a medicine called cyclophosphamide, also known as cytoxin, which sounds terrible and actually is pretty terrible. It was that versus placebo in people with scleroderma and early interstitial lung disease. Uh, cytoxin was better than placebo, which was great because in all those other trials I mentioned, most of the other ones, there was no difference to, compared to placebo. <clears throat> so of course that led us to try to find a medicine that was safer than cytoxin, but was still effective. That was SLS2, which looked at cyclophosphamide, daily oral pills, versus mycophenolate, also known as Celsept, and that turned out to be positive from the point of view that both were effective and this mycophenolate, the myfortic, was safer. So that was, we got the results we were hoping for, which of course led to SLS3. Uh, with, and that says if mycophenolate is helpful and reasonably safe, what if we added one of the new antifibrotic drugs in addition to the immunosuppressive drug, would we get better results with, without excessive side effects. And that trial is ongoing. And if you think about the approach to rheumatoid arthritis, people are usually on methotrexate plus one of the new biologics, plus a little bit of prednisone, plus a little bit. So combination therapy is very common in treating autoimmune diseases. And there's no reason that we can't use it in scleroderma as well after we prove that it either is effective or non-effective. And that's where SLS3 comes in. You have to have scleroderma by those criteria. You have to have some lung disease. 
And the worst part, we haven't started doing it at, in Houston yet, but probably in the next month we're going to be recruiting, uh, as well as a dozen other centers around the country, people cannot already be on mycophenolate or Celsept, and that's the hard part. And they have to get patients before they're started on this medicine, or they have to be within three months of being on it because we don't want to take only mycophenolate failures. We want to take people with new onset lung disease and see if the combination is better than mycophenolate alone. So what the study will do is give people mycophenolate. The study will pay for it. Uh, and once they're sort of stable on mycophenolate two or three months later, we add either the perfenidone or a placebo. So everybody, <laughs> we know is on standard therapy. Everybody will be on mycophenolate, half people will be on perfenidone, half people will be on the placebo. It's a one year study at the end of which we should be able to determine if the combination is superior to the single uh, medication alone. Uh, you get pulmonary function tests, you get a CAT scan beginning and end. So if you are in that category within five actually within seven years of diagnosis, and you uh, have early lung disease, your doctor's thinking about treating it, contact one of the scleroderma centers, and the scleroderma foundation has a list of all of these centers, and if you can find one near to you, then uh, it would be helpful to participate in the trial. So, other trials that are ongoing. Uh, there are multiple ones that have completed recruitments. The abedicept, there's something real sequat, uh, tocilizumab, nintetinib. Uh, these are, they, and they also have kind of, kind of cute names, asset, rise, fascinate, census, uh, where people are placed on the medication or a placebo and usually treated for a year to see if the, uh, the new medication is more helpful. And for most of these trials, you can all be on background therapy. So methotrexate is permitted, mycophenolate is permitted, little bit of prednisone. We wanna see if the addition of this new medication is superior to uh, single treatment alone. So uh, these are the ones that we are currently recruiting, and there's more coming. There's something called lenabasum. Has anybody heard about it? Corbis drug. Corbis has a, a booth here. Um, and its cute name is Resolve. But that is the cannabinoid derivative, which is a marijuana derivative, and therefore a phase one trial. And the FDA is uh, very strict um, about uh, how you handle the drug, but it is not psychoactive. But nonetheless, it's still classified by the government as a, a Schedule I drug the way morphine is. But nonetheless, I can tell you, because I was part of the Phase II trial, that um, it doesn't make you high, doesn't make you hungry, and all of those other things that you associate. We've heard about, of course, from uh, about marijuana. Anyway, this is for skin involvement. is for early skin disease. Uh, so there, there are multiple inclusion and exclusion factors. Again, one of the sort of nice things about this is that people can be on background therapy. So you don't have to stop any medication to be in the trial. There's SLS3 that I talked about for early lung involvement. Uh, there is something called a, a Catalyst, which is a new medication, Bartoloxone, for pulmonary hypertension. And again, you can be on background <laughs> therapy. And then there is a, another one, Bravos, that's using a, a medication called Brentuximab uh, for uh, skin, early uh, skin involvement in scleroderma. Now, the, the last one, Bravos, is sponsored by the NIH. Question. Yes. Is it skin involvement? What kind of skin? Is it tightening? Yeah, thickness. It's a skin score. Uh, we didn't go over skin scores. How many people have had a skin score done? And okay, so you know what it is. It's when your doctor goes, oh, mm, and then writes it down on a little. So you need um, for uh, the skin 
studies. You need to have a skin score usually between 15 and 35, 36. The maximum skin score is 51. That's kind of a perfect score um, and that nobody wants to have, but that's when you have severe involvement essentially all over. Ah, yes, discoloration doesn't count in the skin scoring system. Now, yeah, yeah, unless you're unfortunate enough to have lung involvement, but if not, it's okay. Uh, so there's multiple new studies that are being planned. I've been in this business for over 30 years now, and I've never seen so many studies being done in scleroderma. And, uh, you know, it took 20 years or more to get one positive study, the first SLS study. And I think as time goes on, that we'll get more and more positive studies. Uh, the, the usual way that you um, develop a trial, if uh, you're an, an individual investigator, not a drug company, and you have seen some patients do better on certain drugs, certain features like heart involvement of scleroderma seems to be better when people have been placed on something like methotrexate, even though you're using methotrexate for another reason. And so then the first thing you do is a small single center trial. Let's look at a several patients or 10 or 20 patients. And if that looks promising, then you can move into a larger trial.